What's up everyone, welcome back to another video. As always, my name is Orlando Martel and this is Martel Dynamics. Today we're gonna read Hicks and Gracie's book, Breathe, chapter six, Coming to America. This chapter is basically Hicks and getting to be more mature. I mean, in last chapter, we saw how Valetudo guys and, and uh, Jiu Jitsu guys got into these fights and they eventually got to respect each other. You know what I mean? They, they made each other better fighters. Now at this point in Hickson's life, which is now basically half the book, Hickson has to become more mature. I mean, at this point in his life, he has a family, he has to pay the bills. I mean, it's not just fighting anymore and his father taking care of him. I mean, it's been a long time his, since his father just took care of him. Hickson has been working for his own life, but at this point he has a family to take care of. You know, it's like he needs to take his life to another level. And from what I understood from what he has written in his book, he felt that he reached the pinnacle of what Brazil could offer him. He has won every fight. He has his own school. Everyone knows him. What else can he do? In his own words, you know, there's nothing else Brazil could offer him. So again, in this chapter, Coming to America, the chapter begins by Helio, uh, Hicks's father saying to him like, hey, you could go over to America and work for your brother Horian teaching in his school and you know, you could continue to grow over there. So I'll read the first paragraph so you can see what I'm saying. Ixen begins by saying, there was little for me to prove in Brazil at that point. America was a bigger stage with more opportunities and I thought my kids would have a brighter future there. When I decided to move to the US, Kim and I had been separated for over a year and a half. I went to see her and told her that I would like her to come with me and the kids and give our relationship another chance. She agreed to my offer. I wanted to make a fresh start. So that's why we started to come to America. I mean, we have to remember that he had been having problems with his wife then, Kim, because there was a lot of shit going on. Which, by the way, I want to make two comments. This chapter is longer than the usual breathe chapter. So it took me a while to finish it. And the second point is that regarding this Hickson and Kim marriage problems, this is specifically something I think about because as a man, you have to be prepared to offer your family something, offer your wife something. It's not you just, you know, sit back and relax and everyone does everything but you. No, you have to be able and prepared and able to protect your family, to provide to your family, to give some kind of stability, emotional and economical stability to your family. What happens when, as a man, you're not able to provide these things? Exactly what's happening to Hickson. He's having marriage problems. At this point, from what I've understood, the only thing that gave him hope to save all this is to go to a place where he could find some kind of stability. So now in America, of course, Hickson is trying to see what can he do to build his new life. Of course, a lot of what he can do has to do with Horian because, you know, he got his green card thanks to Horian. He doesn't speak English, Horian does. So at this point in his life, Horian has to, and I mean Horian, his brother, right? Horian has to translate everything for him. So let's talk about Horian for a bit. Hickson, as we know, is the family champion. Okay, he's a family jiu-jitsu champion. What Horian lacks in jiu-jitsu skills, he has in being a good promoter of the family sport. Horian is not only a jiu-jitsu teacher, Horian is a lawyer. Horian is, you know, a, a very good just marketing guy for the jiu-jitsu sport. One of the chapters in the, at the beginning pages of the book begins by Hickson himself saying, while I might have been the best fighter in the family, Horian was by far the best promoter of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. He was a born salesman with a great product to sell and nothing helped spread Jiu-Jitsu more than a portable video camera. So he's explaining that in 1988, Horian made this movie called Gracie in Action where he filmed various Gracie family members just training jiu-jitsu and fighting. And of course, Hickson was included in that movie and that movie helped explode the name of Gracie jiu-jitsu 
through all of America and of course Brazil. Brazil was part of it too. It reached to the point that a very famous actor at the time and still today, Chuck Norris, heard of Jiu Jitsu and wanted to train. So I'll read to you what Hickson himself says of this point. It says, the actor and American martial arts icon was not only a great early supporter, but, all, but was also a dedicated student who eventually earned his black belt. In the 1980s, Norris took a vacation to Rio. Everywhere he went, he heard about Gracie Jiu Jitsu and the exploits of the family. Norris contacted my dad and arranged to have a private lesson. After I grappled with him, my dad told Norris to mount him. And when he did, said, okay, Chuck, punch me. The American hesitated as my dad was in his 70s by then, but Helio kept insisting. Finally, Norris drew back his arm to punch, but before he could throw one, the old man had choked him out. Chuck left Brazil impressed by the Gracie family and invited us to come to America and hold seminar for his students. So as you can see, this is a uh, not good. This is a great opportunity for the family. I mean, Chuck Norris, that's like, you know, a, a very big actor at the time, just handing you the open doors of the whole of the United States to you and to your sport and saying, yo, teach me, teach my students. I mean, the family was already set up for success. Here's a picture of Hoker, Hoyler, Helio, and Hicks and Gracie. I don't know if it was at the seminar, but I'm guessing it was at the time. I'll put a picture up on the video so you can see it better. With that said, every good thing always come to an end. If you don't want that good thing to end, you have to preserve it, you have to take care of it, right? Here's the thing, it's okay to be very ambitious. I mean, I consider myself extremely ambitious, but there's a difference between just being ambitious and just getting over your head and just being an with that said you might think that with this opportunity that chuck norris is offering them you might think that they would you might think that he would accept really fast maybe he would uh, ask for some things but you know he wanted to to have everything perfect you know what i mean as always money gets into this conversation breaks everything up and everything goes to shit. After Horian read a letter from Helio congratulating Norris for having the wisdom to invite us, Horian and I demonstrated some self-defense moves. Then I had a friendly match with Chuck. I let him close the distance and throw a kick, but I got him in clinch, took him down and had him in a choke in about a minute. Even though the seminar was a great success, afterward, Horian and the actor had a disagreement over money. Not only did Horian lose him as a student, but Chuck Norris hired our cousins, the Machado brothers, Carlos, Higgin, Hugger, Jan Jax, and John to teach him. I don't know all the details of what happened, but here's my own personal opinion. How the f did you let Chuck Norris leave you over a disagreement of money? Now he is giving his money to other people and you're just left you know with your dick in your hand it's just a huge opportunity down the drain lost forever so at this point it's not lost forever Chuck Norris hired Hickson's cousins the Machado brothers to teach him yes it's still kind of in the family but it's not the same thing and at this point and Hickson explains this later but at this point for me I mean the family has been fracturing and dividing since earlier but at this point, it just it's just getting faster. All these details with Horian's ambition of just wanting more and just wanting to ex extend the family name, which is good, but the way he was doing it, according to this book, was in all the wrong ways. Yes, it was getting the family name higher, but it was dividing the family. And what can you do with a divided family? There's a saying that a house divided cannot stand. What do you see today in, in the sport? Do you see Gracie Jiu Jitsu or do you see Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? You know what I mean? It'll be explained later. Chuck Norris hired this Machado brothers. Hickson knew very well his cousins. He had trained with them in Rio. He had trained specifically with his uh, cousin, John Jax. I think he was born only, only with uh, a thumb and a pinky in one hand, and that didn't stop him. John Jax, Hickson explained, had such a discipline that if Hickson began training at 7 a.m., even earlier, he was just waiting for him, for Hickson to open the school. I mean, John Jax had this discipline so intense for the sport 
that that made him great. Hickson says that the Machado brothers were one of those family members that extended the family's martial arts through the whole of America. And John Jacks himself became one of the best teachers of Jiu Jitsu. But as this happens, family again is getting more fractured. Hickson says that they would not be the only graces to challenge my brother's authority and go their own way since they once they arrived in America. The Gracie clan was splitting and fractionalizing in the States and there was nothing that my brother could do about it. Just like our Scottish ancestors, Gracie clan leaders were beginning to feud. Here's the thing with the name. With Gracie Jiu Jitsu or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Hickson explains it best. As we have been talking in these videos, since basically Ho's death, you know, when his wife uh, gave Ho's academy to his brother instead of to his father, since that moment, for me as a reader of this book, family has been divided. It's not the same. At this point in America, it's reached the point where it's getting so ridiculous that it, it just, instead of getting the family name, the Gracie name higher and higher and higher, it's, it just obliterated it. Let me know what you think in the comments because it's just crazy. I'll read it to you. In addition to a black belt, Horian also had a law degree, which he often used to press his advantage and overplay his hand within business dealings. This left the family members with bitter feelings. Even though Helio wanted Horian to lead the graces in America, it was easier said than done. There were just too many of us moving in different directions and Horian's effort to control the clan backfired. Look what happened. After he threatened to sue members of the Gracie family, whom he had grown up on the mats with, for using their own Gracie last name, family members surrendered. Gracie Jiu Jitsu got renamed Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I mean, I would have done the same thing. My last name is Martel. And I get to this position where I cannot name this channel Martel Dynamics. I'll name it uh, Puerto Rico Dynamics, USA Dynamics, who knows? But that wouldn't stop me to do what I do. And instead of the last name getting more recognized, it got obliterated in my opinion. Of course, today you can find schools that have crazy Jiu Jitsu as their name, but it's not near as close as what Gracie Jiu Jitsu meant before the 1980s. Very quickly, Hickson dedicates some, some time to another cousin of his, Henzo Gracie. This was a cousin that came to America and did the same thing as the Machado brothers. Even worse for Horian, bloodied and charismatic Gracie warriors like my cousin Renzo would come to America posing yet another threat to his monopoly. I'm not sure if Henzo is a Gracie or a Machado. I'm pretty sure it's a Gracie, but but Henzo, you know, this is just another example of family members just doing their own thing and ignoring the sh out of Horian Gracie. And look, I don't know Horian. I mean, as a reader, he's not that important to me. He's just one of Hexen's brothers. He's just stupid. I mean, Horian, if by any chance in the world you see this video, I, I mean, no disrespect. I'm just talking about what I read in the book because, guys. Check this out. Hickson is a family champion at this point in history, right? Everyone of the Gracie family is coming to America just to have a better life. You would think that Horian is just doing the same thing. I just don't understand his tactics. Unlike Henzo and the Machados, I initially did not have the option of breaking away from Horian because I got my green card through my brother. Our relationship hit a new low when he told me that he might take away my green card if I didn't follow his orders. I mean, what? If my brother did that to me, I would have done the same thing Hickson did, which is, you know, you know what? You do you, I'll do me. We're brothers, I love you. That's it, I'ma be my own man. Who are you to tell me what I do and what I can't do? And I know that in the Gracie family, you know, you have these hierarchies and, and you know, if you're my older brother, you, you, you have some authority. But it's reached the point that, I mean, Hickson is a grown man. He has his own family, you know, wife, ch children. I decided to take a leap of faith and open my own academy. Kim had brought her savings, so we had a little big of a nest egg that we could use to gain 
our independence. So what Hickson did was open his own school. I don't know if he bought or rented a place, but it was named the Pico Academy. This was the beginning of Hickson in America. He had his own school. He had the opportunity to implement his own philosophy in his school because at this point, to this point, he has been always teaching in his father's schools, his brother's school, everyone's school instead of his. Here are a few of the philosophy points that he implemented in his own school. I'll read it to you. I love teaching Jiu Jitsu because it revealed a person's true personality. The coward was fine when he was kicking ass, but as soon as he got in a bad position, he would be the first to explain, stop. I tried to get my students to examine not just how they fought, but how they felt when they fought. You can see that what Orlando Kenny taught him is you know, going through him, through Hickson, through, to his students. It's not just fighting Jiu Jitsu just to do the techniques and that's it. It's just to connect with your partner or to connect with the other part of the fight in another level so you can understand the dynamics in another level. The invisible aspects of Jiu Jitsu, just like the sense of touch, weight, momentum, and physical connection to your opponent are very difficult to teach. This is not a rational intellectual knowledge that one can learn from a lecture or a book. Only thousands of hours of training and some of my American students were getting it in record time. This is very interesting to me because this is not stuff that you're taught in school, in university, in college. In any case, this is pseudoscience. You know, do you think that prestigious university would give a job, a teaching job, a professor job to someone like Orlando Canny? At Hickson's new school, you know, when everyone hears the name Gracie, there's a school, you know, all the most dangerous men went there. And Hickson says that by dangerous, he meant cops, fighters, grapplers, you know, all these men that know how to fight. One day, this 250 pound Greco-Roman wrestler and early MMA fighter, Stephanus Milk Sakakis, came to the Pico Academy. So he went, I think, just to, you know, test the waters, see what's happening. He suggested, you know, just a fight with Hickson, just to know what he can be taught. Hickson suggested Valetudo, of course, and this guy says, I only wanted to grapple. And Hickson says, okay, wh whatever you're gonna do. What happens is that when the fight started, Stephanus put his knees on his face, on Hickson's face, and showed him that he understood the importance of discomfort in a fight. But as with a lot of these fighters, they are trained to uh, fight in rounds of like five minutes. They cannot last long. So what happened is that in 25 minutes of hard grappling, I made him tap five or six more times. He was choked and disappointed afterwards. Nobody's ever done that to me, he said, before asking if he could be my student. Not only did he raise the level of performance, but he also served as one of my school's bouncers when necessary. This is a very interesting history or story to me because Jiu Jitsu is a very humbling sport. If you think you are very tough, all you gotta do is get into Jiu Jitsu. It doesn't matter from what I've heard if you're a boxer, maybe if you're into judo or any other grappling martial arts, maybe you are kind of used to this. But if you are just not into martial arts and you think you're tough because you go to the gym and shit, just go to a, you know, jiu-jitsu school. The first move they do on you makes you feel so weak, feel so uncomfortable, so impotent. I remember the first time I went to a jiu-jitsu academy. I haven't gone in a while because of other stuff, but just the first day I left the school just thinking, Man, I'm so vulnerable. <laughs> you feel so vulnerable. If you have to fight with someone who knows jiu-jitsu, you just feel weak. <laughs> in this story in particular, after this 250 pound wrestler got beat, he served as one of the school bouncers when necessary. Why? And this is where it gets interesting in jiu-jitsu because it's just a reflection of the rest of life. There are in life and there are also in jiu-jitsu. Hickson says that there are assholes in jiu-jitsu that come to an academy just as new guys and want to beat the out of white belts. That's not just right. You go to school to train. You don't go to, you know, beat the 
out of people and, and just be an For example, I'll read to you what happened in Hicks and Schools one day. It says, in addition to the formal and informal Gracie challenges to be fought, my stronger student had to protect my weaker ones. For example, a big kickboxer whom nobody knew once showed up at the morning class. During a simple takedown drill, it was just a drill. He need a white belt half his size in the face and broke his nose. Not only was this move unnecessary, it was obvious to everyone watching that it was not an accident. Luis Lemao, which was one of Hickson's cousins, I guess, sent the white belt to the bathroom to stench his bleeding and spoke in Portuguese to the Brazilian students, who translated his simple message for their American classmates. We don't want this asshole in here. He crossed the line by beating up on a white belt, and now he must pay. For the next 40 minutes, the kickboxer was thrown, submitted, and stretched over and over. He never again returned to the Pico Academy. Hickson's philosophy is that, and I quote, I never asked my students to do anything that I was not prepared to do myself. If you stepped onto my mats, I was going to push you the same way I pushed myself. But that doesn't mean, he explains later, that you just take your anger and everything out into someone weaker than you. For example, in jiu-jitsu, everyone knows that black belts just don't know how to manage force that well. I mean, I am a white belt. I'm a very amateur, just a very basic white belt. And I remember the first times that I went, uh, maybe I used a lot of force and was trying to force my way out of an uncomfortable position instead of using technique. And I remember them telling me, no, no, no. If you just try to do it by force, you will just get tired. White belts have this baby-ish attitude to the sport because they are white belts. I mean, what do they know? What do we know? But if you're a blue belt, if you're a purple, brown, black belt, you know And if you just go to a school and just take it out on a white belt that doesn't know anything it's just wrong so at this point in the book you know the book has some pictures and then continues the story so i'll show you the pictures i'll put it on the video so i can talk about them and then continue the story so the first picture it says that it's helio hickson and margarita gracie at the hickson at hickson's second birthday party so i think that woman that we see over there is hickson's I don't know. Actually, I don't know if he, if it is his actual mother or if it's, you know, the one that took care of him and raised him. Next picture is Hicks and Gracie at Copacabana Beach. I think maybe he's like, he seems like four or five. I don't know. So next picture is like him, him modeling in Rio. Next, we have Hickson and Gracie at Copacabana, although we cannot see Kim's face. Next picture is Hickson at Rio in 1988. Then we have Helio and Hicks and Gracie training in Rio de Janeiro, 1988. Next is Hickson and Hawks and Gracie in 1998. I don't know what, how old Hawkson is, maybe he's like six or seven. So now we have more modern pictures. Hickson and Hicks and Gracie punches Masakatsu Funaki in 2000. We haven't reached this point in history, but I guess we have the pictures. Then we have Hawkson and Hicks and Gracie after the Masakatsu Funaki fight in 2000. And the last picture is Hickson and Colleen Gracie, one of his daughters in 2014. So here at this, so I'll continue the story. Here we come to the point where his philosophy of life gets into his jiu-jitsu. As Hickson has taught us that it happens. However you see your life, that will reflect in your jiu-jitsu. Sometimes I would tell the students to line up against the wall and then announce that I was going to have a grappling match starting on the feet with every single person there. Other days, I would have an expert striker put on boxing gloves and make my students try to take him down without getting punched. The advantage and disadvantages of fighting a person on the ground versus fighting them on their feet is just a whole teaching lesson. What he used to do is that he would have in-house tournaments. A student might be a king for one day, but with the success came a new higher expectation from their teacher. Hickson talks about this white belt that during his first interclass tournament, the white belt got caught in an arm lock, refused to top out, and got his elbow capsule popped. He still came to class the next day when the match started, the he was fighting a water polo player. Took him down and walked right into a tri triangle show. 
But without saying a word, the Brazilian students, using pantomime gestures, silently coached the white belt to follow their directions and got the water polo player in a triangle choke. So this white belt improved quickly, of course, and his newfound confidence bled into other parts of his life. And this is Hickson's philosophy. If a student won, I'm reading, I would simply say, props to you for winning, you could have won faster and smarter. Anyway, congrats. If he lost, the lesson was, congrats, you could have made worse mistakes. And you didn't panic like the last time. If you improved your arm lock defense, you would, wouldn't lose to him again. So there's always a lesson. If you win, congratulations, you could do better. If you lose, congratulations, you did these mistakes, you have done worse. And if you did the worst, now you did the worst. So there's, you can't go any lower. So let's improve from this. So there's always a lesson. Hickson says that Orlando Canning made me realize that anyone could teach you something, especially your students. I realized that at a very early age, the value of inter interacting with people from all walks of life. You know, there's this lesson from Jordan Peterson. No matter which who you are talking, assume that he can teach you something, no matter who you're talking to. If it's a, a, a doctor, a, a medical doctor, a PhD in a university, or just uh, the one who mobs, or the one who gets your trash, or just your employee. No matter who you're talking to, assume that he knows something that you don't, because that makes you or forces you to respect the other person and have a reasonable and civil conversation. Life in America for Hickson was a lot different from Brazil. And a lot has to do with the lawfulness in America. In America, Hickson says that the laws are the laws. They are not just laws to look pretty, they are laws to be followed. Like the United States, Brazil had been a colony, but it was one where Europeans at first went primarily to fill their boats with gold and emeralds some beautiful brown woman and go home. In contrast, America had a much more idealistic constitution and grew into a more orderly society, literally. People here did things that I had never seen before. They stood in line, stopped for traffic lights, and mostly obeyed the laws. These may seem like obvious requirements for a workable society, but to me, this was a strange new world. My transition to living in American society was not always smooth. I can imagine it being shocking to have to now wait in lines because, you know, what the f Everyone's doing the action, it's actually doing the line. I can't imagine just being like, this is weird. If you come from somewhere where everyone cuts and it's just chaos. When when you wait for traffic lights, I mean, are they robots or monkeys just following directions? Now, I'm trying to put myself in his mind, you know what I mean, to, to try to, to see how shocking it is because I think it was Mark Twain that said that traveling is the opposite of ignorance or something like that. It was, it, it's a beautiful quote. I'll put it up on the video. I don't remember it, but I think that Mark Twain got it right. Because for us that are accustomed or used to following order and just having these laws and following them, it's not easy to just imagine someone that haven't been used to these laws, you know what I mean? So regarding lawfulness in America, Hickson uh, tells his story that, that when he got to America and got to the point where he could buy his first car and began driving, there was this time where, you know, he ran the red lights, he drove alone in the carpool lane, he made U-turns whenever and wherever he felt like did. He didn't respect any laws or any rules from the, from the streets, you know what I mean? There came one day when he was going to go surfing with some friends. He put the surfing boards on top of his car. They didn't strap them right, so when he was in the highway, the surfboards just fell off. They crashed into a car that was behind them. It turned out the car was an officer, a police or a highway patrol officer, it says. Then Coyote, a Brazilian friend and student who had dreadlocks and was covered in tattoos, approached, put his hand on the cop's shoulder and said, hey officer, no problem. The cop jumped back and barked, take your hands off me. Although I was able to resolve the situation without getting arrested or shot, I kept getting ticket after ticket and soon lost my driver license. You know, besides this situation, Hickson kept breaking the law. 
just driving reckless. So he kept getting ticket after ticket after this situation and he lost his driver's license. The lesson, problems could not be fixed in Los Angeles the same way they could be in Rio. In Brazil, there are many ways to resolve a problem. In America, however, you are held accountable for the law to the law most of the time. Most people in the US obey the rules because the laws themselves are rigid. There isn't much room to get around them. If an American gets arrested for stealing a bike at when he's 18, his life can be defined by this one stupid decision. In Brazil, whatever you do before the age of 21 is largely forgotten. Because we can't rely on the law, Brazilians learn to improvise and must play the right cards at the right time. There are many more jokers and wild cards in the Brazilian deck than in the American one. Everything is new. Regarding just order, because I don't want to say lawfulness, because this next story is not of law, it's just of order and just rules. He says that waiting in line was another new experience. He says, I had never stood in line in my life because in Brazil, you force your way to the front. Everyone does, not in America. So he explains that one day he was in a store and the cashier was just taking a particularly long time with a client and Hickson says that he tried to interrupt with a quick question but when I but when he said excuse me where are the the shopkeeper looked at me sternly and cut me off you will need to excuse me for a moment sir I will get to you as soon as I finish with her so he says that when it was my turn the shopkeeper answered all my questions and gave me his full attention over time I began to see the value of obeying these formalities it was I who had to adjust not, not other people Hickson observing all these different things compared to his homeland in Brazil. He explains that America was also a much better place for his daughters, Kawan and Kaolin, because they could be anything they wanted to. I think it was last chapter that we talked about Helio Gracie's, his father, Helio Gracie's philosophy on women. According to Hickson, Helio wanted his daughters or just the girls in the family to be just wives and mothers and that's it and Hickson wasn't Hickson didn't agree with that philosophy and Kim neither Kim and Hickson got more secured let's say or or more confident that America was a better place for them so at this point in life Hoxson which is Hickson's oldest son you know was getting bigger it's a uh, it's always very drastic change for a kid and a teenager to just move from his homeland to another place wherever the place is and in america this hit hard for huxon huxon went to school and he went according to hickson he went from being the prince of rio to just another hispanic looking kid in a california public school who didn't speak english so you can if kids are already bullied, imagine you being you just looking different, speaking different, you know, there might have been racism in this too. It's just human dynamics. It is what it is. I mean, I'm sure you can find it anywhere, not just in America. Anywhere this will happen to you because it's just human. I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying it happens. So Hoxson got to the point where he was just being reckless. He, he fought kids in school. He, he wasn't just right. And when Kim, his mother, Hoxson's mother, tried to rein him in, he became rebellious and defiant to her. She did not want her kids to be Gracie brawlers. It was too late for Hoxson. Hoxson was already on a self-guided mission to be the greatest Gracie of his generation. Reckless, yes, but forever a fighter. I think I heard what I'm about to say in a podcast where uh, Hickson was explaining this that Hoxson was very very similar to Holes in the in the sense that Holes was a good man he was a good fighter but he was just reckless and that brought Holes to his own death which is eventually what happens to Hoxson but let's keep reading next in Hickson's life this Olympian and just wrestling gold medalist champion Mark Schultz came into the arena, talked to Hickson. He wanted to learn jujitsu, but at the same time, he wasn't sure. So it happened the same thing. As the last guy, he challenged a Hickson to a wrestling match, just, you know, in house. It was just in Hickson's academy. Hickson beat the sh out of him. A two time world champion and Olympian gold medalist is not used to losing. 
and Mark Schultz was upset even more than the first time. Oh, because he uh, Hicks and beat him twice. Because the first time he was not that prepared, second time he was more aware, he got beat anyway. I told him that he was a great champion and that he and that if he had been wrestling, the outcome would have been different because I would have been playing by his rules and not than mine. So Schultz fell in love with Jiu Jitsu, trained and earned his black belt, fought in the UFC and became a great representative of the martial art. Long story short, in this American Jiu Jitsu arena, we got to the point of the book where we have two or three pages left where we read about the foundation of UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. <sighs> you know, I've been watching UFC for a long time until I learned about Jiu Jitsu in general, Hicks and Gracie in this book. I didn't know that the UFC was founded by Gracie's just to promote the Gracie Jiu Jitsu martial art. Korean Gracie had been looking for this uh, partnerships and shit to promote this event, this Vale Judo event, you know, everything goes for the uh, promotion in general of Jiu Jitsu. You know, he wanted to prove Jiu Jitsu in general. Hickson being the family champion is He's the natural choice. Remember that Horian and Hickson had been having this feuds and this, you know, uh, tension between them. So what ended up happening is that Horian shows Hoyce Gracie, which is Hickson's younger brother, to fight and chose Hickson as a backup in case Hoyce lost the fight, loses whatever this decision disappoints Hickson because this has been everything he's been waiting for you know a Valley Tudo event in America you know he, Hickson was about to make his name in America but it's still a family fight so he trained Hoyce he was there for him every step of the way Hoyce won it is very curious to me that Hickson says that today's UFC events and MMA are much more dangerous than Valetudo events in the past because Valetudo events, you know, everything goes but you know, you are punching with your bare knuckles and it's not the same as having gloves. You would think that gloves are safer. They are not. I'll read to you what Hickson's opinions are on the matter. The first Ultimate Champ Fighting Championship was a single elimination tournament held in the Magnico Sports Arena in Denver, Colorado in November 1993. It was much closer to Valetudo than today's MMA. There were no gloves, no weight divisions, no rounds, and no time limits. I did not like the way Horan's partners have promoted the event as a human cockfight. All their television and print ads announced that there were no rules, which was not, not entirely true because, you know, further in the book, the rules were that no biting, no eye gouging, and no groan strikes, which takes a lot from the fight because I know t in today's standards, it's just, hey, let's be gentlemen, no I'll gouge you, no groan strikes. But in a real fight, it doesn't work that way. And Vale Tudo is meant to be as close as possible to a real fight, but in a controlled environment. Do you know? It's just, I respect you, do you respect me, but let's fight Vale Tudo. Everything goes. Not that shit of no I'll gouge you, no groan strikes. You know? If you're a fighter and you want to defend your yourself in the streets, literally everything goes. You just want to defeat your partner. Which, whatever. I'll continue reading, but I want to clarify that. Other television and print ads announced that there are no rules, which was not entirely true. It was too sensational. Yes, bare knuckle fighting can be bloody, but it is nowhere near as harmful to the brain as boxing or today's MMA. Boxers and current MMA fighters suffer much more brain trauma because they wear gloves and have taped hands. Without them, fighters would break their hands hitting someone in the head over and over, thus mitigating the potential for repeat blows. So essentially, in today's MMA and UFC culture, you have gloves, you have taped hands, nothing will happen to your knuckles, so you can keep hitting, but that is more dangerous for you as a fighter, and as Hickson says, that's why we have so much brain damage in the sport. Before, yes, it can get bloodier, but after, I don't know, 10 punches, 
you wouldn't be able to hit anymore. So your head in that sense was safer. Another point is that if you got hit so hard, you know, you would be just knocked out. The fight ends. It's not like today's fights where you get knocked out, you get some water and and you keep fighting. This chapter ends with Hickson saying that today many criticize the first UFC as a infomercial for great jiu-jitsu. But it is important to remember that in order for Hoist to win that first tournament, he still had to defeat three much larger opponents in a single night. This is no small feat for any fighter. The chapter actually ends with Hickson saying, during the 1990s, an, un an unusual thing happened to Brazilians when they flew to the US. Some of their belts magically turned from blue to brown and even worse, from purple to black. In the land of the blind, only the one-eyed man is king. All right, people, that was this chapter of Hicks and Gracie's book, Breathe, coming to America. Let me know what you think in the comments. It's important to me to know. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Bye.